Hi everyone, welcome. I'm down here in my wormery and the systems that you see over here, all these buckets and bins, they're running worms as my composting systems. Vermicomposting is the technical name for it. Worm farming, worm composting. And all you really do is you throw your compostable kitchen scraps and compostable household waste, maybe even yard scraps or stuff from your garden, whatever. The worms will eat it all. And what we'll be left with is some really nice compost that you can feed your plants with out in the garden or even your bushes or shrubs or trees. So in my arrangement here, the oldest stuff is up here, top left. And you start kind of snaking your way down until you make your way all, to the, all the way to the end of the line over here is where I got my newest systems. The newest of my systems is in this little tiny green tray. The system's now six weeks of age. It's been 19 days since we last checked in on these guys. I think they're due for a feeding. I have peeked in once in a while just to make sure everything's stable and okay, and it does seem to be so. But no fresh food's been added. So I came down here with a little change of pace for them. I've been giving them only worm chow as they're only feeding lately, but I've got some coffee just to change things up for them. So I'm gonna get a glove on, get that system up on the bench, and we're gonna get them fed. So let's get to work. If you were with me during the last check-in, you'd remember that this stuff was not on here yet, this sprinkling of diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is there to try to capture some of these little flying insects that have been making themselves at home in this system. And if they get tangled up in this stuff over here, it sticks to them, it starts to uh, adhere to their little body parts, and then they eventually can't move. It'll, uh, it'll even cut into their into their systems a little bit and ultimately take them out. So I put that stuff in here as sort of an extra one-two punch. The main stuff I was really trying to combat the flying insects with was a batch of this stuff. You might have seen this around. If you have a pond or some sort of fountain or something on your property where there's gonna be standing water, you, you drop one of these things in here. It's meant to really eliminate mosquitoes, but it also seems to work quite nicely on controlling the um, the gnats and fruit flies, a couple other types of insects that it's able to control. So I, um, I've gone ahead and started reinstituting the use of this stuff. For a while I was putting it on all my systems everywhere and eventually I saw no more flying insects so it seemed like the situation was solved but in some of my newer systems that came online after I had already run out of this stuff and you know those systems never got any I did start noticing flying insects moving in so I've um, I've since reinstituted the use of this stuff and it takes a little while, you know, it's it, it's not going to kill the flying insects outright. It's going to interfere with really the next generation. Because these flying insects, they're all going to make themselves at home. They're going to hang out, breed, lay down their eggs. And those eggs will even hatch and everything else. But I believe it's the larva, that first infant stage of an insect, that the, uh, the mosquito dunks it's really a, it's a bacteria called BTI, which stands for something I don't know how to pronounce, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> so it, uh, it interferes with the larva being able to develop to the next stage. So it stops them right there, so then it's really the next generation I'm trying to tackle with this stuff here. So now, the, the stuff that I've been feeding them till now is a, it's a mixture of different types of grains and nuts and seeds and maybe flour or starch or any, anything I got around the house that I could put into the little blender and pulverize it down into a nice powdery consistency for the worms to eat. And I would think that after, oh man, it's a nice big, nice big fat worm there. I would have to imagine that that's probably one of our European night crawlers that survived. And I would think that something like this little guy, a little skinny, dark colored worm on which you can't really see that, that bulge, that that thing that they call the clitellum on the on the worm. Those are the Indian blues. So if we spot at least a couple red wigglers, then we know there's a hope that these little guys have a chance to recover. The European night crawlers and the red wigglers I have elsewhere. It's just that this is the only system in which I've got Indian blue worms. 
here's another pretty chunky, large sized worm. Again, I'm assuming that these somewhat larger sized worms are the European night crawlers. But I'm not very good at distinguishing worms from one another. Because I could be confusing them with red wigglers. Because I thought that the little yellow tail is um, indicative of the, the red wigglers. But then again, maybe the European night crawlers have that too. I forget. I thought the tiger, tiger stripes, the the stripe pattern was on the night crawlers. And I thought that that's what I saw here on the front end of this little guy. However, on the front of this guy, I'm not sure I saw it. So maybe we've got a red wiggler and a European night crawler here side by side. It does seem like they've done quite a nice job converting a good amount of the material in here down into castings. And you know what I do see everywhere? <laughs> and I mean everywhere. You know, they're pretty clearly visible. You could see one right there. It's the cocoons that they leave behind when they've been mating. So it does seem like a number of these worms have managed to track down another another one of their species and started reproducing to try to fill up the available space. That's a very, very fresh, newly deposited looking one with that light color to it, as opposed to some of the other ones that you see in here that are much darker in color. The, you know, the passage of time is what causes them to gain sort of a darker color. And then, uh, and then eventually the cocoon will hatch and multiple worms usually come out of one of these things. I don't think it's one worm equals one cocoon or vice versa. It's, I believe most cocoons have more than just one worm in them. Baby worm. And I think that just varies from species to species. But then again, I'm not really that good when it comes to all this technical stuff. <laughs> Distinguishing species by their appearance or knowing the specifics of their reproductive reproductive. Um, methods and stuff. What do we have here? Some sort of a peach pit. Something that's going to take a long, long time, if you ask me. <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess we came in here to feed, but I don't see the harm in sort of taking a little bit of extra time just to browse around and get a sense of how things are doing in here. So here we go. One of the, um, I think it might have been the last feeding. We gave them a a sunflower, a whole sunflower, so the head of the sunflower was on there, and this would have to be the the stem of it, you know, with all these tougher fibers, but it might be, it might be that they've actually eaten up the, um, the flower itself, so I totally forgot about that. I thought I was giving these little guys worm chow only, but it does seem like I did treat them to a nice sunflower recently, so luckily I've not been too monotonous on my feedings in here. I've already started introducing a little bit of variety for them. So what I've got for them today I guess is similar to what we've done till now. A little bit more worm chow and I guess the coffee will be the one thing that they've not eaten in quite some time. I've not fed coffee in this system yet. In their previous system they were probably fed coffee many many times. But not yet in here, so they're probably wondering, how come I've not gotten any coffee lately? Well, that would be the ones that would still be able to be traced back to the previous system that they lived in. Regrettably, that system sort of crashed and burned, and I was only able to come away with um, a handful of worms. You know, I did pull the audience, because so I attempted to show as many as I could, as, you know, as best I could to the audience how many worms we've got in here and I took everyone's estimates on how many worms populate this system and averaged it and I I didn't check I don't I don't know for sure but I believe that the the number was somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 worms was the estimate for how many worms live in here I would almost have to say that I don't know it does seem to me almost like there's more but I could totally be you know projecting my wishes and hopes onto what I think I'm seeing. So I've um I've opened up a little opening down here. A little gap that we can set up their feeding in today. I wanted to use a little bit of uh 
little bit of these soiled napkins and paper towels and stuff like that that I bought down from the kitchen. It always seems like a shame to take stuff like this and throw it into the garbage. I set it aside so that when the time comes to feed the worms I can just plop the stuff down into my worm bin and it'll get composted rather than sent off to the landfill. And, and I think it is time to start reintroducing the application of the BTI, the mosquito dunks, because the little flying insects are in here for sure, and I know that the, you know, the, uh, the effects of this thing are a little bit um, downstream of the application, so I understand that I've got to wait for, uh, I guess, the current generation just to peter out, and then the absence of reinforcements will hopefully cause us to have no more no more flying insects invading our space here so let's just start introducing some of their foods here give them a little bit of this coffee maybe I'll save some for another layer I could stack this stuff up into multiple little layers here if I don't end up dropping all of it onto the table <laughs> Got to be a little bit more careful. And let's see, the other stuff we've got is like put a little bit of grit in here for them. This is pulverized eggshell, which I use as grit. A little bit of this worm chow. Ooh, I don't know if that's too much. Let's see if we can kind of blend it in with the neighboring materials here. Okay, let's see if we can get this feeding completed before I make a complete mess of this place. All right, you know what else? Some of these top covering pieces of paper that we had on here also seem like they've really done a, a great job but have probably reached the end of the line as far as their life expectancy they're barely holding together so let's introduce them as supplementary bedding to give to the worms when they come down to the middle here to check out the new foods they've been given a little bit of coffee a little bit of worm chow a whole bunch of fresh supplementary bedding hopefully they like it the, uh, the BTI, this BTI bacteria, the mosquito dunks, has no effect on anything but the larva of those few specific insects that it targets. So it's totally safe. So I don't worry about using it. I know a lot of people, you know, see stuff like that as a pesticide. Some people even see the diatomaceous earth that I had sprinkled out on the top here, that white powder as something intended to help do away with the insects. But these things are all um, safe, as far as I know, to be used in your worm bins. The, the white powder, the diatomaceous earth, is really more of a mechanical, um, you know, insecticide by really, uh, you know, injuring the, the insects and lacerating their bodies. And, you know, I don't, I don't uh, envy any insects that get caught up in that stuff whereas the whereas the BTI just sort of interferes with development and growth and the life cycle of the the creature and there too I don't I don't believe that there's any sort of discomfort that goes along with that I would have I would have to assume that it's just a you know just a hindrance to their ability to develop beyond that larval stage and then that's that they'll just kind of reach the end of their life and never transform into that next thing that has the capability to reproduce and create more so i uh oh boy i don't know if i'm going overboard here you know we've got a whole day's worth of coffee we've got a good amount of bedding which is also technically food for them so maybe we shouldn't go overboard but then again who knows maybe it'll be another 19 days before we get back in here and maybe it's not a bad idea to start up in the ante on how much we feed these little guys besides the fact that I've been trying to scale the feedings to be suitable for a fairly small sized population of only 36 wormies but from what I'm seeing in here we might have more and then with all those cocoons I spotted I think it's fair to assume that in the near future we're going to have even more so it might not be a bad idea to start turning up the amounts of food I give them. 
as time goes on as their numbers start to increase. So to cover up we're going to be bringing back the that top covering piece of newspaper as well as that top covering of plastic but before we do I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of fresh leaves out here on top. It's fortunate that the moisture level in here seems pretty good so I don't worry so much about placing a, a somewhat dry material in here such as this. I think things will level out and I think the moisture levels in here will remain adequate to keep things comfortable for the worms. A lot of times I feed frozen foods, veggies and fruits to my worm bins and then as that stuff starts to starts to thaw out I know it emits moisture but nothing we've fed here lately does that. The coffee might have been a little bit damp but it's not going to bring with it a great deal of moisture neither is that dry worm chow. So we did spray in a little bit of that mosquito dunks which might help a little bit but we're going to have to keep an eye on moisture in here. Luckily the plastic is protecting us from moisture loss due to evaporation. But I do like to position it in such a way that there's still room for the system to breathe. But it's also good to know that a large amount of the moisture that's in the system will be retained by not losing it to evaporation. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on here. If I see the, uh, the flying insects continuing to, you know, be pests in here. I might put a little bit more of the diatomaceous earth on again afterwards, but we're not going to bother with that now. We're pretty much done here. So before I take a moment to put things away and clean things up, let me just really quickly say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, as always, please don't forget to leave me a quick thumbs up before you go. That's always very much appreciated. And if you haven't done so already, please also consider subscribing to the channel too. That's very much appreciated as well. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.